more welcome from my end. My name is Philip. I'm working here in the managing board of the World Economic Forum. And I'm only here to welcome you in order to underscore, to underpin the relevance of today's session. Because we are talking about inclusion here in India. And there is no inclusion without diversity. I would even go one step further. So if you would like to have a free and creative economy, you need first and foremost a free and creative, so diverse society. That's the reason why we are here today. So thank you very much for being here with that strong participation. We are very happy to provide all of you with this today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and it's uh, such a pleasure to welcome all of you here for this uh, session on diversity. And we are going to try and do this uh, session slightly differently. We are, there are a couple of things we're going to ask all of you as an audience to do as well, but I'll just come to that in a minute. Just wanted to welcome our very special guests who we have with us, uh, Smithy Zubinirani, is very little introduction, Minister of Textiles in India. It's fantastic to have you with us. Um, Shashi Mukundan is here as country head, India of the BP Group, and is going to be talking a lot about what, what's been happening in diversity. Parmeh Shani, uh, Shani is the head of uh, the Godridge India Culture Lab. Talking about diversity, I have to say it's so great you're adding diversity of dress here at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> Can I just tell you that this is just for Smriti? This is for Smriti. This is right. Banaras handloom, Smriti, just for you. I think that uh, it's extremely significant. Normally, it's presumed that women dress up for men. And that's the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you've done it. We're off to a great start. <laughs> but uh -huh. diversity of dress at the World Economic Forum, you know, all these ties and suits. So, that's so Bikram, next time we have to get you in a... In a, in a I, I have to say, it's going to take. A, I'm not so sure about the shoes, but I'll certainly try the. You I'll with Banarsi will do, Vikram. Okay. Banarsi, I mean, you know, next time we're having a panel like this, and both of you talking to me about Banarsi, yes, I will. I'll, I may try that, not necessarily the shoes, though, I have to confess. And uh, Shamina Singh, it's wonderful to have you with us as well, President MasterCard. So thank you all so much for being with us. Now, before we jump into this, the forum wanted us to try something in the nature of an icebreaker, and it's a new thing that we're trying with the format. We'd like you all to spend one minute, turn to somebody, any of your neighbors sitting right next to you, and tell them a story of some time when you either witnessed somebody being excluded or experienced it yourself. And what did that feel like? Just one minute. Turn to the person next to you and see if you can share one of those stories. Witnessed exclusion or experienced it yourself. And I looked at each other and just smiled. So that's very obvious. We have many stories. To exactly. I was going to say, I haven't met you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. You're a YGL, right? Yes, I am. That's not a, a well known fact about me, but I am. Which year did you become? Uh, this year. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. We're in the next panel together as well. So uh, Neelam has told me I should take yes. you by the next All right, let me get. Panel. Yeah, Neelam told me, she said, don't make it late because Smithy has to come. Just lost, you just lost yeah. These are obviously really powerful stories because I'm going to now struggle to get everyone's attention back here to the panel. So many people, like, you know, the whole came out of NFW, Amazon India. I mean, the stuff that you've done is so good already. But they won't talk about it. I'm saying that if you look at the challenge or gender. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, if I can have your attention back. What's the conclusion? Did everyone have a story? Please raise your hands, everyone who either heard or narrated a, a powerful story of exclusion. So it's, it's common. It's way more common than, than we would think. And um, I am therefore going to come now to the panel. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to throw it open to a more broader discussion of what we can actually do to make India more inclusive. And that's in every sense of the word, because and I just want to ask you, Smithy, when you think about it and, and the government thinks about it, the issue of diversity and in inclusiveness, there are various facets to it. There's gender, obviously, but there are other facets of diversity as well that, that probably need to be looked at. I think the first, um, at the first instance, we would need to recognize that diversity is not a challenge pertaining only to India. It's a challenge worldwide. It is a challenge that people across various sectors, uh, various geographical areas are facing and positively responding to. The very fact that uh, today we are talking about it on an economic forum 
also has a huge significance yes. because it was not an element of discussion. It was mostly a part of hushed whispers which were happening in corridors and definitely not conversations which were transpiring between men and women on open forums. So I think we have to recognize that we have gone a significant way at least in that direction that we are open about it, talking about it. It is a challenge that needs to be responded to, not only in business but across uh, various facets of life. Uh, but there has to be a recognition of another fact. That when we look at women and we talk about women in our country, and especially if we talk about successful women in our country, uh, Lego is doing a project of women scientists because they want to change the discourse of how women are projected or how they are received from mm. childhood. Can we imagine such a project in our country yeah. where the fairy tales which are normally told to all of us and not only in our country but across the world is about a woman waiting to be rescued always. The yeah. second issue that, that seeps in is if you look at a woman from a business point of view. Uh, I was recently in an event where we were uh, felicitating women who are achievers, who are extremely powerful in the business community. And every time I saw the audio visual, the audio visual was about how great a woman she is because she looks after her family also apart from the business. Yeah. And the fact that she also takes walks and watches Sazbahu serials. Now imagine you the have a same with that. No, my issue is <laughs> my issue is this. Yeah. When we award men, do we talk about that humane <coughs> facet about men yeah. in yeah. business? Yeah. Fair enough. So that is the signals are very mixed and they are out there. They are not very dominant for you to claim a victimization. But it is said that if a woman is extremely aggressive about reaching a particular goal, she's taught thought of to be too ambitious, too aggressive and not feminine enough. Yeah. And we need to describe women who are achievers also with such a humane touch that it becomes very palatable for all of us. So I think that it, it, it starts from right from childhood, goes up all the way till you achieving. Uh, I'm sure that all the women here, most of them did not actually turn around and tell stories of their own victimhood or stories where they have been in, in any way um, discriminated upon. Because just the discussion also tags you as somebody who can't get over the fact that yes, her gender is a problem. So Did you ever feel gender was a problem? I have never used my gender as a crutch. Never. Not as a crutch to get acceptance, not as a crutch to get an entry into a door. I have said that treat me as well as you would treat a male colleague. And when I was a professional in the media business, I know that women in our country for the same amount of work, for the same kind of work, get 56% less pay as compared to men. But that is also a topic which is not openly discussed and debated. It's an accepted fact. We are getting an opportunity to work, so we'll make a mark for ourselves. So we are getting there. But like I said, there are many women who do not use their gender okay. as a stepping stone or as a crutch. All right. Uh, as we go forward, I want to just come back to one of the aspects that you began by saying that it's a global problem and in India, it's, I'm still not completely sure that we are not actually ahead of other parts of the world when it comes to our attitude to diversity. I mean, India is, of course, one of the most diverse countries anywhere on the planet and has been for, for centuries, uh, if not millenniums. So, you know, we should look at what our, what our history in that aspect is as well. But if I can turn to the rest of you before we come back to that. Uh, and one of the other twists that we're introducing in this particular you know, panel is if you have a story to tell about yourself or about somebody else you know, which you think illustrates the issues around diversity, please feel free to do that. So why don't I come to you next? Sure. So I'm Parmesh, and I actually have an image to share. Um, this is an image of my colleague, Naira. And Naira happens to be the first transgender employee at Godridge. I happen to be the first out and proud gay employee at Godridge. And um, over the past few years, Godridge, as many of you might know, is a 119-year-old legacy company rooted in the idea of Swadeshi. Um, and, but over the past few years, we've just transformed radically on various facets of diversity. And I was just nodding, you know, uh, like a naughty <laughs> doll when Smriti was talking about gender, because this is stuff that we talk about all the time. I want to, at this panel, talk about LGBT diversity, because that's something that uh, we've taken the lead on. Over the past few years, we've become so, I mean, you know, whether you look at our policies, 
um, equal rights policies, same-sex partner benefits, whether you look at um, the culture that we've created, whether it's performances, talks, film screenings, etc. Whether you look at the kind of advocacy that we've been doing, um, whether in sponsoring film festivals or so many other LGBT you know, efforts across the country. We've become, in a sense, the only Indian company which, is, which has taken up this issue. Why have we done this? We've done this because, first of all, fundamentally, we believe that you know, when you talk about diversity, you can't be diverse about some things and not be diverse about the other. So you can't say, I want gender diversity, but I don't want LGBT diversity, or I want you know, a diversity of, of geography, but not that. But the other thing is also data, because we're at the World so Economic just, just Forum. To, just just to, to, to push you on that point, yeah. you're saying that if you are to be inclusive and you have to be diverse, you have to be diverse and inclusive about everything. I think it's a mindset. More than anything else, inclusiveness is a mindset. When you say everyone is equal, irrespective of where they've come from, what religion they belong to, who, you know, what gender they are, you cannot exclude who you choose to love from that. So that's number one. But the second thing, and I really want to mention the data because this is the World Economic Forum. In the morning, we released a report which said that India went up to 39 now on the Global Competitive Index. Now, there's so much research. There's Gallup research that just came out that said that had we, were we LGBT friendly, we could have gone up by 10 or 15 more points as well. So all the data says that you can be more globally competitive if you're LGBT friendly. Um, certainly, it helps in innovation. Certainly, it helps in attracting uh, the best human capital. Um, again, there's, there's, I was reading something which said that 64% of young Indians Mm. LGBT or straight want to work for a company which is LGBT friendly. It's not just LGBT employees who want to work for LGBT friendly companies. Straight people too want to work for a company which just respects them for who they are. So there's enough of a business because case you're with if there's data. A culture, if there's a culture of tolerance, it will extend to a larger culture number of Culture of areas. exclusion, I mean, you know. Which, well, also. Uh, of also inclusion, I mean, culture of not exclusion, rather. Yeah. Um, which, is, which is also so prevalent in corporate India. Yeah. All right. So you, Vikram, I'd come would you from agree a, with his views on any story that you want to share? No, so I, I want to come at this in a different way. Right? I want to come at this more from an you know, international company. And you know, when I look at globally today, you know, like as uh, Mr. Rani said, you know, you're becoming so big and everything is getting so closed in that you, know, you cannot not think about diversity and you cannot not think about inclusion as you look at these things. Look at our kids. Our kids are learning from this across the globe, right? This is why you're seeing kids from small villages who are becoming so successful. Why are they successful? It's because they're able to get to see that diversity across the globe. So my story is about a girl called Pushpa, and she's from a small village in UP. She came from a family which had five siblings, more than five siblings. She has almost a dozen siblings. She was one of five daughters. She lost her father. Her father died at, a, uh, you know, at, the, at, her, at his place of work. The company just gave them 10,000 rupees. He had a lot of debt, so the whole family ended up, you know, selling everything that they had. This girl took it on herself and said, you know, I'm not going to become a victim for this. I'm going to go do stuff. She came to Delhi. She actually started working as a maid servant, enrolled herself in the uh, university, started to study for 10th standard. She passed her 10th standard. She's now got an Aadhaar card. She's got her, all her family uh, medical insurance. She's got, uh, you know, LPG connection at her home in the village. She's, uh, you know, she's now enrolled for the 12th standard. All of this in a matter of three years. Not only that, you know, her other four girl siblings that are there, she even got the brother-in-laws thrown in jail for harassing her sisters. So what she's done is she's learned by coming here and watching and learning. You know, she, she didn't become a victim. She said, okay, I'm going to take this on my hand. And now her goal is, She's collecting money to get a Maruti Alto so that she can put that into the Ola uh, cab fleet. I mean, it's an incredible story, you know, to see somebody not taking it as a victim, but saying, okay, I'm going to go out there and do this. And this is what you're going to see across the globe. So for us, when we look at it as a business, it is a, it's a business case. There is a business case for diversity and there's a business case for inclusion. It's a business case for inclusion and that, that story, in addition to all the benefits of its own and the transformation of society, you're saying it's a business case for it as well. Let me get you in. Get me in, Vikram. <laughs> <laughs> Include me in the conversation. Yeah. It's, an, it's, a, it's an inclusive it's panel. It's an inclusive so conversation. Now, you haven't spoken yet, so it's yes. your turn. So, here's an, uh, so I guess the perspective that I'd like to share, uh, in addition to the ones that have been um, already talked about, are, uh, sort of relates to my own experience as uh, the daughter of immigrants. So my parents are 
from Punjab and uh, Ajmer, and they went to the United States in the 60s. And, um, and so I sort of come at it from a place of um, uh, fitting in everywhere and not fitting in everywhere. <laughs> and sort of the, the experience of diversity when you are the daughter, of, the first daughter born in the United States of immigrants from India raised in a small southern town. And if anybody knows anything about the South in the United States, you know that at least in the 60s and before then, it was a pretty homogenous um, uh, homogenous place to be. And so um, being the daughter of a um, Paka Sardar in uh, you know, a small town in, in Chesapeake, Virginia, could have been quite an experience. But to your point, um, when my father went uh, over to study, the people in, he first went to a, a place in Georgia, which you really can't get much southern than Georgia in the United States. And the people of the town all bought lottery tickets uh, f to win a car. So when they won the, when the lottery was announced, they gave all the lottery tickets to my father and gave him the car. Wow. wow. And that was for a young Pakka Sardar from uh, India coming to Georgia to do his studies so that he could have the transportation to bring his wife and, and kids over. So this notion of diversity, there are no, there are no blacks, there are no whites, there's no if, there's no ands, there's a, it's all something that I think is created to your point. Yeah. It's a frame, it's yeah, a state but, of mind. And so I think that there are positives and there are negatives, but I also happen to work for a company, as you said, that's also uh, the CEO is a Sardar. And, yeah. um, you know, so this notion of fitting in everywhere and not fitting in anywhere is something that we wrestle with a lot. And the way we come at it, to your point again, is that there is a huge race and war for talent. Yeah. If we don't recruit the talent into a company like a MasterCard or anywhere else, if we don't invest in women in technology, in women in science, in women in math, in women in economics, um, and we don't bring our whole selves to work, then we're going to lose the war on talent. I mean, I hate, I hate to divert away from India just for a minute, but seeing as you started it, I have to ask the question, what is going to happen to diversity in the United States a month from now? <laughs> <laughs> One month and five days from now. Well, Hillary will be. <laughs> well, I mean, if she's not, then what happens? I don't think diversity is something that, you know, is going to happen or not based on uh, an election, hopefully. But as that, you, can, a, you guys can tell me you, here. You had, a slightly, you had a slightly nervous tone to your voice when you said hopefully. <laughs> Vikram, you're putting words in my mouth, as okay. any reporter would, obviously. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's your job, I know. It's my job to well, still be TV. <laughs> so will, will, will diversity remain, you think? I think an appreciation for diversity will remain no matter who wins the election. Yeah, but my guess is it will remain because, again, if you think about it, there's a business case behind it, right? And, and you will need to do that because if you look at the U.S. today, it's much more, you know, different than what it used to be, you know, when I started. When I started my career, I, I felt like you, you know, when I went to a, a work in the U.S., I felt like a minority. I felt like, you know, somebody who had to really prove yourself because here you were, a brown guy in an oil company, which was all black suited, white shirt people. And you know, and now all of a sudden here you are trying to fit in with that. And you needed to understand, you needed to work through it. So you know, it, it's, you, you, you also feel the same thing. But I think the point that I was trying to get to and both of these, and all these stories illustrate is, and I'm gonna come back to India as a result of that. If you take what has made the United States great over the period of time, it's because it has assimilated, it has taken so many people, it has been inclusive, and that's been one of the major sources of strength of the United States. And that, in a sense, is also what the Indian history has been. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Smithy? I think that we need to look at the diversity issue not only from a business point of view or a political point of view. It is actually a, a people's point of view. In, uh, in the U.S., uh, whatever I know of its history, it was a people's movement that brought about or ushered in a change. Today, if there is conversation about a lady leading uh, and possibly taking on the reins, uh, we as Indians can be extremely proud that we have had women in positions of power yeah. throughout our polity, cutting across uh, political lines. And I think it's a huge compliment to the men in my country that it has not become the subject of uh, you know, debate. Yeah. The fact that a leader uh, needs to be less of a leader because she is a woman has never been a conversation in at least in 
in the Indian diaspora per se. And I think that is one of the biggest achievements, at least from my uh, nation's perspective, which is a compliment that should be extended to every man in my country, that we've had women come up uh, yeah. in, in politics. But yes, the and challenge... If I can take that argument a little forward, what, just what you were saying, you're right, it's happened in politics across politi the political spectrum, but even in companies. Yes. If you look at banks, for example, Look at the number of banks in India where the CEOs are actually women and it hasn't really... And media, it, the television and industry in the has television seen a lot of women leading. Banks, like you rightfully said, uh, have led uh, in terms of breaking the glass ceiling and that whole, uh, you know, uh, conversation goes. Banks have led. So wherever women have had not only opportunities or a level playing field, but also wherever women have had mentors to take them forward, women mentoring other women to take them forward. We have seen some significant change. We've seen that in media. We have seen that in the banking sector. And I'm sure that we'll see it across all sectors. Now we've had a huge uh, emphasis put on girl-child education in the schooling system. We are seeing the benefits of that. And now as a nation, we are pushing towards more and more women getting educated in the higher education sector. So whenever we as people put our strength behind, our resolve behind, a particular issue vis-a-vis -vis diversity, be it gender or otherwise, we see a, a kind of a change reflect in the polity or the economy accordingly. Great. I just wanted to know what you thought about that because it, I think it's a really interesting and a, an accurate point that she makes that India quite often gets bad press over the way you know women are treated and on gender issues, which is also Listen, that's on you. correct. You're in the media. So. Yeah, but, okay, blame everything <laughs> yes. on the media. Fine, it's all, it's, everything is the media's fault. Let's take that as a given. But, Having said that, that's also correct. You know, women's safety is an issue. All of those those problems come up, and yes, women are treated badly in in, in a large a large number of cases. But in a country like India, sometimes the opposite of what is true is also true. And I think as Smithy very correctly said, in many areas, India does not have as much of a problem with a glass ceiling as you do in some other countries. Whether it's a corporate world, whether it's a political world. The, coming back to the U.S., the U.S. is still to have a, you know, a female president, again, may happen one month from now, but till now hasn't happened. It's, it happened in India, you no, know, what, 50 years ago or 40 years ago. So I think in terms of the, when I think about diversity, I run something called the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. And the basic, the basic theory there is connecting productivity and potential to the networks that drive the modern economy. So if you think about leadership, if you think about, um, and it, you know, if you think about by the ones who's been a president, who's been a senator, who's been a prime minister, who's been elected, I think it's all about making sure that we create an environment that allows the most people to reach their most potential and to be the most productive. Because those are the things that unlock the economic potential of a country. So we've just released a study in, in, uh, in partnership with Rama Bijapurkar um, and, and ICE 360 around uh, the new Middle India and who comprises the Middle India, their purchasing power, how they live, earn, spend, and save. And the biggest uh, takeaway from that study is that the more you create an environment where people are connected to the networks that drive the modern economy, connected to the ab an ability to reach their potential through their labor productivity, regardless of who they love, how they're born, where they work, where they live, then you're creating an economy that unleashes potential. And ultimately, to me at least, that's the inclusive growth that we're trying to achieve. You want to add to that? I actually want to go back to what you said about India being inclusive as such, and for gender for sure, but even for LGBT, which is something that I spoke about earlier. If you look at pre-British India, we were very inclusive. If you look at our mythological texts and you know, people like Devdutt Patnayak and there have been so many other scholars and authors who've written about it are very inclusive. It's just, I'm, I'm just wondering, and so that's one. If you look at young India today, I recruit for Godrej. We go to colleges across the country. For most young Indians, it's not an issue. So for exactly these reasons, right? People want careers, people want better lives. <clears throat> so I just wonder why <clears throat> middle-aged India, <clears throat> I think the issues are in the sense with middle-aged India, people like us. Because the young don't India... Don't call me middle-aged. I'm not a <coughs> well, middle-aged. Okay, I'm 40. I don't know whether that's middle-aged or middle-aged India. Okay, I, I, I'm can so can glad. We, can we be we'll inclusive on an age point of view? <laughs> we'll be age inclusive. I'm be inclusive. We'll be I'm age inclusive. inclusive to those yes, of us yes, who are yeah. aged. Okay, we're all middle-aged. Like, we're all middle-class. We're okay. all middle-aged. I'm okay with middle-class. I'm 40. Is that middle-aged? I'm 42. Okay, no. because I'm not. <laughs> Okay, let's say if you talk to people below 25, okay. you, talk to, you talk to people below 25, 
they have other issues, right? They want to succeed on the parameters you were talking about yeah. in your study. If you look at our history, it's inclusive. So I'm just wondering why, when there's such momentum for inclusion, say gender, say sexuality, say everything, you go out there, people want to be included and people want to include. Why yeah. then are we so apprehensive about widening the net of our inclusion is my question. Yeah, I, I actually want to just take it, and I'm going to throw this to all of you. A country like India, there are, there are some who would argue, uh, and I think that that would probably be correct, that India doesn't have a choice but to be inclusive and to embrace diversity. Because, Smriti, if you, if you take a look at it, India is probably the most diverse country in the world. So if you add all the different ways in which Indians are different from each other, it, from not just on gender grounds or you know, LGBT grounds or any other grounds, it's on religious grounds, on regional grounds, on language grounds, on ethnic grounds, on race grounds. Just look at what a diverse country this is. And if we are not going to be inclusive and accept diversity, <coughs> yeah. we, we're going to struggle, which is why I, all through our history we've been inclusive. I think that uh, apart from Ms. Singh giving a description of her own family, uh, let me make a disclosure. Mm. So my dada is a Punjabi, dadi is a Maharashtran, nana is a Bengali, nani is from Assam and <laughs> husband is a Parsi from Gujarat. Mm. <laughs> and I carry, apart from the fact that I'm a woman, I have a surname like Irani which does not do you well if you're at US Customs. Uh, why? <laughs> You need to understand uh, the fact, I mean, this is my personal belief. When you say India has no other choice, uh, change cannot... It's also actually in our know, DNA, you know, frankly. I, I think that change cannot be a compulsion. Yeah. If you want that change to permeate, if you want that change to be lasting. Uh, it is a change which has to happen very organically. It is a change which emanates from people. Uh, legislation has only a certain, um, uh, you know, jurisdiction within it which it works. It can't change hearts, it can't change mindsets. It can punish you if you do something wrong. So I think that if you genuinely want to talk about a change in mindset, then it has to start from when you're very young. Uh, he's right, uh, we are middle, 40, we have, I have kids. It has to start with my kids recognizing that everybody has to be respected, irrespective of their region, religion, sexuality, whatever. But for us to say that I want to be inclusive, but let XYZ, let corporate tell me how to be inclusive, let government tell, to, tell me how to be inclusive, that will not, I think, uh, cut ice. We as people have to be ready with our families, have those conversations with our families, yeah. and then we will see that change happen. Otherwise, if you say that change is nothing but a compulsion, but also shall be thrust upon you as a policy, you will not see definite change. Yeah, I, I, you can't have change by, by government policy, I, I think. But he, to, to his point, change. are we less mm. inclusive than we once were? Or so where does the change have to be? Do we need to go back to what the historical norm in India has been or do we need to try and change no, I, that? I, I don't think that we are less inclusive. I think what's happening is we are more aware because of the fact that you know there's more information being given out to people. We are much more aware of it and what you're seeing is you're seeing more and more uh, people trying to you know become more inclusive, you know think about diversity and such. I mean just take the case of uh, the IAS system, right? If you, I was just, when you were talking, I was just thinking about it. It's probably the most inclusive thing, right? You look at how you get placed. You get placed in different parts of India. You may not be from Kerala, but you know, you might be posted there. It can be a woman, it could be a, a man. And you know, and, and you grow up and then you know, you keep shuttling back and forth. And you know, you're bringing so much of diversity into the center. You know, how many places in the world do you have that kind of uh, inclusiveness that's happening? It's just we're not recognizing it, we're not thinking about it. You know, why are we successful is because we are able to do things like that. I think what we need is more of a system in place where we can start thinking about, you know, how do we make it more an institution or a system where we start giving that opportunity for everyone to come in and, and participate. So, you know, it's, can I be a little bit more inclusive, you know, in my work? You know, we keep talking about there aren't enough uh, women, uh, you know, growing up in the organization. Why is that? You know, you start thinking about it and you say, okay, you know, you talked about mentorship. You know, can you mentor these people? Can you, you know, because when you look at it, when, when you bring people into an organization, you've got 50-50, right, men and women. But as they start going up, it's going down. Why is that? It's because, you know, how do you provide them that? So one of the things BP does is, you know, globally we've got this thing called as agile workplace. Mm -hmm. 
which is essentially we are giving people the opportunity to work from home, you know, flex times, maternity leave, you know, and what we're doing is we are also telling the men, you need to also think about agile workplace because you need to now start recognizing your spouse who's working, who needs to also do this. Right, but if just I can... Take, take, I'm sorry, I'm just taking up from what Mr. Mukundan is saying. Um, about a workforce that is agile, it's a it's a issue that you undertaken under BP. But let me just give you a small example of how women, though capable, never find positioning. Um, when I became the HRD minister in the IIT council, the first meeting that I took, I saw that there were all men in the room, and I said, "Don't you have a woman representative?" So they said, "Aap hai na?" I said, "I'm here by the virtue of the office I hold." They said, "No, they are not good enough to be in amongst the top layers of engineers of this country." Seriously? Yes. That's crazy. And this is some of the most celebrated names. So uh, I had a nomination which came up to me and I was asked to nominate two people and the nomination list was all men. So I said, why can't you find me some woman who, of repute who can take that position? They said, no, we don't have any. So I picked up my phone and I directly called Tessie Thomas. And I said, ma'am, would you consider being a part of this council? I could almost hear her voice break and she said, how did you think of me? I said, can you imagine in a country where you have a master like Dr. Kalam, ably assisted with uh, Tessie Thomas, for her to feel, oh, you just discovered me? I said, you're one of the most talented Indian scientists. Mm. Why would I not want you to have a position in IIT Council? And it is my privilege that she is one of the first women to get into the IIT Council. So when you talk about women in science, women in economy, technology, if you don't see them in positions of power where they are seen to be making decisions, right. women at the bottom of the layer feel that ja ja ke aur kitna ja payenge. Yeah. So what, one of the things, I, we, do, I, one yeah. of the things we do is we, we, we've now forced into, you know, when we have a job opening, we have to make sure there's at least one woman who's qualified for that job. And the other thing we do is when we interview, we have a panel that interviews, we'll make sure there's at least a woman on the panel interviewing as well okay. so that you know you get that diverse view and diverse thought process into it yeah. just to add to that earlier you all said change can't be mandated but you can as you did with Tessie or as you're doing with BP or as they're doing with Godridge say for LGBT you can create an in you can create an infrastructure which encourages people to step ahead no, so a lot of it is I, not I mandated. I tell you where I yeah. differ on that yeah. issue see it's not as if Tessie Thomas just became a scientist when I became minister. Sure. Yeah. So she has been there in the Indian scientific community yeah. to be placed in those positions where she can make a difference. So that's what I'm saying. Why did but I have that? Her. No, but yeah. why did I have yeah. that outlook? Yeah. It's because my mother and my parents taught yeah. me yeah. that there are women out there who are extremely talented, yeah. who might not have the luck to know the right people at the right time at the right place. Yeah. When you get an opportunity, take those women ahead. Yeah. So Tessie Thomas is way more experienced, way more celebrated, yeah. but she never had somebody to say that come out and be a part of a council which makes all the decisions so for it's all a nudge. the It's a nudge. And, and here, the, like issue a, is, and here yeah. the issue is women are 50% of the population yeah. and there are lots and lots of talented women who can come into that position. In other areas, there, there are other questions which happen that how do you need to start training them from an earlier age. Yeah. And that's why when you come back to affirmative action and making sure, for example, there are more representations of Dalits in positions of, of higher educational learning, then the question comes about, you know, they need, you really need to improve it from the primary school level and then the secondary no, school level. I think that reservation is available. Yes. Reservation is available even for posting of academicians. That is not the challenge. But like I said, if I have an, uh, a kind of an outreach to a Tessie Thomas, that happens because a mindset is developed as a child, as a young girl. So when you talk it's about inclusion, inclusion, it's about, yeah. like he says, orientation. orientation. And that cannot yeah. happen when you're 40 and in a position of power. It has to happen when you yourself are growing up with those values. And you're told, I mean, look at the dichotomy, Vikram. We are a nation, a civilization, which said, Vasudev Kutumbukam. We said the world is one family, eons back. Yes. And the if I look at the uh, if I look at the contradiction today, in the Arthashastra, there was punishment for sexually harassing a woman at the workplace, but the sexual harassment at workplace bill got passed in Parliament in 2013, which means that as a nation we have a legacy of inclusion that yeah. we can be extremely proud of, of yes. diversity, of understanding the rights of each human being that we can be extremely proud of. There has been a gap somewhere. There have been shortfalls. We as people can fill it. But we need to start not only at, at 
you know levels of corporate or policy or politics for that matter yeah. or education but we also have to start it at home but also the i think to your point uh ma'am the the incentives have to be aligned and so i think when you're talking about at least when i think about government when i think about private sector and public sector the incentives or the structures um, have to be aligned. So if I think about a corporate America, for example, and a company like MasterCard, if the incentive is to attract the best talent, regardless of orienta sexual orientation, gender, et cetera, et cetera, you have to go find the best talent. Because there's a, there's a recognition that without the best people around the table, innovation will not happen. And so in a world that's driven by technology, if you're not fostering diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, diversity of talent, you're not going to be a create an environment that fosters innovation. And one example that, um, that we've done as a company is, it's the same thing Ajay, uh, Ajay uh, would say, they, uh, HR would bring him a slate of candidates that um, wasn't as diverse as he thought it should be. And, it, yeah. and for him, it was more about diversity of talent and leadership to make sure that there are ideas around the table that are fostering innovation to bring new ideas to the company. And so he suggested that, uh, because he got the same answer, that, look, it's very tough to find engineers, technology, things like that. So he said, OK, then let's start recruiting from women's universities. He said, how many universities, how many of our HR consulting teams go out to universities um, that, are, that are single sex? And let's yeah. go start, let's add them to the mix, at least, of universities from where we're recruiting. So those are the types of strategies that one can employ in order to incentivize in a way that brings in the talent. So let me just shift focus a little bit and come into one other aspect of diversity that perhaps you don't think about often enough which is simply diversity of thought and diversity of opinion. And there was a strong view that people had that with social media and everything else that's happening, you will throw it open and there'll be a far more, you know, you'll be listening to lots of different opinions and different voices and all sorts of things will come in. Um, today, there are some people who are wondering whether that's really the truth or you've, today it's sometimes seeming that everyone's getting into ideological echo chambers mm -hmm. and are shouting down anybody who has an opinion and I don't mean shouting down only on television, <laughs> but in general, we shouting know what down. You mean. We know what you mean. <laughs> it's, it's like a, let's be diverse out here. So you know, <laughs> everyone's entitled to their diverse stance. But any opinions that are contrary to, to yours, you don't want to listen to them, you want to shout them down. And quite often, in ideological echo chambers on social media and other things, you will not allow other voices to be heard. Is that something that you think is, is gathering momentum? So I personally think while all of that is happening, there's also incredible new spaces that are coming up where people are expressing their voices. For example, women might not have representation on national TV as much. There's Khabar Lairia, which is a newspaper run by women in Bundelkhand. Television news is almost entirely run by women. <laughs> you know, by women. No, run by women, but are, are the topics about women or whatever. So that's one thing. Also. That's yeah. one thing. But in Bundelkhand, there's Khabar Lairia, which comes out, which is women run. It's an incredible newspaper, which is women run, women funded, which runs up. Now, they might not watch nightly news debates <clears throat> with 10 talking heads all shouting over each other, but they have a very rich no um, source of about. news. <laughs> They're a very rich source of news. So I, while I agree there's a lot of echo chambers happening, it's, I think it's happening in English speaking and perhaps English and Hindi uh, and, and televised media. I think if you look at media at large, I'm actually seeing a range of things. I'm actually seeing incredible but, examples of gender, LGBT, all other kinds of diversity out there. So, are you seeing more diverse opinions or less? I, I think I'm, I'm seeing more diverse. So as a business leader, I would say, you know, you want to encourage more thoughts because, you know, that's what happens. So I always, when I talk to my team, I always say when you talk about diversity, it's the people that you bring around your table, your boardroom table. But that, that's just a tick in the box. What you need is how do you include all of them? How do you get their thoughts into it? You know, and then how do you make best out of it, right? So it's always good to listen. And you, if you're a good leader, you will listen. And, and you know, so that means you should allow people to come out with their thoughts because that will get you the best inclusion. And then that will come out with best. In fact, if you look at a lot of the uh, leadership in the Indian companies in India today, you will see some of the issues they have is the fact that you, know, you, yeah. you don't get that uh, wider, you know, thought process into it. And then what's happening is then you've got people who are around you who are actually your clones. Yeah. And that doesn't help. I think leadership so, is actually uh, a critical point in all of this. I mean, anything, we've all been sort of talking about points in time, but yeah. 
honestly, it's about leadership. It's about integrity and it's about authenticity, about uh, what you're doing in the world. So I think true leadership is about this idea of, it's, I sort of call it tri-sector leadership, but it's the ability to, to integrate the public, the private, the citizen sector, but most importantly, to integrate the inside and outside of the individual. But I'm, I'm actually looking from the point of view of the individual. And so I just wanted to get your thought on this. I mean, as, I think, as somebody who's also been right. trolled a fair amount and other things, you know, yeah, there I is, think that are, is, is free thinking going down now a little bit? Vikram, you have to recognize that freedom cannot be defined as you can only, you are free to speak whatever I like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it has to be, you are free to speak whatever you like as long as you don't break the law. And uh, social media now has given people the right and the freedom to challenge status quo, to challenge information which you deem to be correct, but they have enough sources to come back to you and say that no, if you're basing your point of view on a piece of research, then this research has another uh, possibly point of view yeah. to it, or maybe this research is flawed. Uh, I have, as a minister, seen the benefits of the internet. In my uh, prime minister's campaign of building, toilets in every government yeah. school for girls. Uh, when, we, when he spoke uh, in 2015, August 15th, uh, by the 17th of August on a website, we had put up every school information and we told citizens at large that this is the government's information which we receive from districts and from states. You as citizens can course correct it and tell us whether it's wrong. If it is wrong, if you do not have a toilet, if you'd like a toilet built, or if it's a toilet which is completed, you'd like to go check, please give us your reviews. And that is how with the people's participation through the internet, with the government at the state and the center, we managed to make a success out of something which people said is impossible to do in one year. Right. So yes, uh, the ideological eco chambers that you refer to, which I'm sure on your Twitter account harass you a lot. Uh, uh, I not need as much to, uh, as not as much as you would think, but there, there we are. No, but the very fact that you're traumatized enough to bring it here is... No, I'm uh, saying in general. <laughs> I'm traumatized not so much by the social media, but in general. It's, but if you we, look have at to, it, we have to recognize that in a democracy, uh, there is a recognition when it becomes uh, too toxic. There is a recognition when it becomes extremely beneficial for a conversation. There is a recognition when that engagement becomes productive. Yeah. And when it becomes, uh, you know, an element of linking the dots. Many people have helped people find uh, children who are lost, yeah. Yeah. Uh, parents who are in distress in the floods yeah. we have seen, the army and people coming together. So it has its benefits, but, the, but everything has its pitfalls. So we should yeah. take the sugar with the salt. I mean, in general, the benefits are absolutely undeniable. I was just sort of wondering overall about the, the, the freedom of thought that, that increasingly is existing. I want to now just come to all of you, including the panel, and just get some ideas. Before we leave the room, you know, five, ten minutes from now, if there is one idea or two ideas that you think would substantially push forward uh, the task of, of you know, embracing diversity and making sure that we are a far more inclusive country, what would that be? And while the panel thinks can about I, it, let can me I start. Actually, well, let me just go to some some of the members of the audience, and then I'll end with the panel. Yeah, why don't I come to you? Because that's that. Yeah, okay, let's just start here, please. Yeah, you can just hold the mic. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to recognize all minorities. I'm slightly disappointed that the disabled haven't even been mentioned. I was, I was about to come to you. Where yeah. diversity is discussed here, so. And well, is that so, uh, is that something which is getting better or worse? I mean, the question of access is, I think, a really serious question that we need to address. Uh, I think it is an important country. challenge. For example, uh, even when the Delhi government introduced the odd even a couple of months back, they actually forgot to exempt the disabled from it, even despite the public transport infrastructure that Delhi has. And actually, I had to go to the high court and file a PIL to have the disabled exempted mm. from it. So I think that is a big challenge. And I would love to know, especially from the three people from the private sector, on the initiatives they have taken to include the disabled. Actually, anybody wants to talk? Because, because yeah. he, that, that is something else that I think is a very powerful example of what we need to do to be more inclusive. And this is one area where I think India is far behind many other countries in equal access for people with, with, with disabilities and, and maybe no, I, and that's something which uh, we Lipun, need to push. your point is well taken because I, uh, when I was not a minister, I had started something called Sakshap, which was basically a base paper for those who are physically challenged as to how to bring about policy interventions for them. And I'm glad that most of the interventions that I could do as a minister 
from uh, from a point of view of access into educational institutions to waiving of fees in institutions like IITs from everybody who is physically challenged. Those are the initiatives which we have taken. But uh, like you rightfully said, that this is another scope of inclusion that actually needs main focus. Yeah. Because the challenge for the, uh, the physically challenged or the disabled, as Mr. Malhotra calls it, is a challenge which needs to be looked at uh, from not a gender or a sexuality point of view, religion or region point of view. That's a conversation unto itself that we need to have from a corporate polity or policy point of view. The other thing is, I think in the United States at least, I mean, when I was an intern in my undergrad, um, I was working at an organization called the United Cerebral Palsy Association of America. And it was that year that um, President Bush, the first President Bush, signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which mandated that all public facilities and all private facilities accommodate, um, regardless of ability. Um, and that, I think, is one instance where government does play a role in terms of um, equalizing access for yeah. all involved. Yeah. All right, I think that's a valid point to take. Yes. <coughs> Mike, Mike's just coming to you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say first, can we create a definition of diversity if we're really talking of that? Because if you really see the entire panel, I think it got l restricted to you know men, women, and all that. So if you really want to say diversity, can we first create a d diverse defi definition uh, I, of I that? Think, yeah, I, I think we looked at all forms of inclusion. Therefore, need to be need to be done. Yeah. Let me just see. Uh, yeah, the gentleman there. Hi, my question is for uh, Smriti, ma'am. Uh, you've rightly mentioned that, you know, as Indians, we've always had this idea of inclusion. Do you think that the curriculum that exists today, because in all, almost all panels that I went today, people have pointed out that the primary education in India is, is a major gap that we need to come. So do you think that at that point, imbibing those values, so first they have to come from the families, but do you think that education can play a major role? And if yes, what steps would you recommend or that you have already sort well, of... Well, the steps that I took when I had that position was apart from the fact that you weave off uh, fees for those who are physically challenged or for that matter those who have done exceptionally well but are uh, women and cannot afford higher education in premier institutes like ISTs, waiving off fees for them, getting them additional support. From a school perspective, uh, what we did was to ensure that you talk about more and more women who have contributed to your history, to your economy and start making children write essays about them. Because uh, I realized that the first thing a child understands is when they want to do a little bit of a research for the essay they're writing, they suddenly realize that, uh, oh, I did not know this lady existed or this was her contribution. So one is that. The second is women in science and technology is what I was pushing, which we as a government are continuing to push to have more and more women in positions where they can influence decision within institutions. For instance, I had the opportunity, I had 11 vacancies for chairmen for um, uh, National Institute of Technology and I picked six women and uh, they said that how do you pick six women we didn't have these many before I said because your uh, the prerequisite for choosing a chairperson was that they have to be some brilliant uh, people in the in the business world or in the corporate world so I had people like uh, Chitra Subramaniam the chairperson of uh, the National Stock Exchange all these women come forward and, and now they are leading these institutions and effective, uh, effectively affecting the administration in those institutions. Right. So when you talk about education, it has to be done not only from a curriculum perspective, but also from the perspective of administration because that is where you will get a holistic impact. All right, we are out of time now. So Mr. Bajaj, one quick comment from you and then I'm going to get final thoughts from the, from the panel. Thank you, I'm Madhur Bajaj. Yeah. I fully endorse Smritiji's contention. You cannot thrust empowerment on women. I truly believe that men and women are equal. I would like to believe that men should feel empowered in the empowerment of women. Women should feel the joy. So please don't exclude men. However, your lady colleague has excluded men in the bill which allows nine months of uh, <coughs> maternity leave. Why not men? I would like to bring up my children too. Like those, why men should be excluded. But coming... Well, I, I ran this campaign to try and get paternity leave in my organization and 
because women in, in my organization have six months maternity leave and men had 15 days, but it had nothing, then I finally got it to 15 Can days, we continue so. that uh, yeah. thrust in your channel? <laughs> yes, uh, I would love to certainly. do that before. Uh, but my two questions are, with women being so equal to men, why is it that 50% of our boards are direct of a single woman director, though there's a law which says at least one woman. So what we do is, in order to do what I call khana purti, <laughs> we have similar thoughts. <laughs> we are putting our wives or mother or daughter there just to fill up the gap of law. Yes. Why is it only the 5% of the CEOs of India, if not the world, I don't know, world, are women? What's right. happened? But that's exactly, I think Mr. Bajaj makes my point that you can have a law come into force, but it's incumbent upon people to bring about that change and that change to permeate. But as a rider, Mr. Bajaj, I went back to work after giving birth in three days. Wow. So I didn't take any maternity leave. You know, okay, you, you've just silenced all of us. <laughs> you've silenced all of us. We'll all shut up now and sort of hang our heads quietly. No, no, okay, but we have, I, we have, I, I think that I'll just you take a minute. You made the case for a law which exists, but for it to be enforced, it has to be a people's movement, a movement from the corporate world. You know, and there is a case uh, through a McKinsey report which says that uh, businesses which have had more and more women yeah. in management positions actually see more profits as compared Absolutely. to other businesses. Absolutely. We'll have to do this later. I have to get final thoughts from you. Just, out of time. I, I want to support that because this is a very important point. As two years as Women's uh, Empowerment Committee chairperson, and I had all very powerful ladies, I wanted yeah. to change it to Men's Empowerment Committee. We, <laughs> you know, we came to the conclusion which you said women are not able to reach the top positions because of the break. Right. Which are the two breaks? Marriage and childbirth. Okay, Mr. Break that barrier to... by what you just now said. Either come back early by crash system, whatever it is, or flexi time, flexi uh, location. So that the ladies are given okay. work which okay. they can work with. So I'm sorry to wrap you up, but we have to be completely out of time. One, one quick line. So very line, quick. one suggestion which we can walk out of the room with, which immediately pushes Inclusion. Sure. One and is train your kids see. for empathy, uh, echoing what you said. And I'll add a second because I think it's very important for our LGBT population. Really get away with 377. It's an antiquated relic of the British colonial past. It has nothing to do with a global economy like India. So. The review. Uh, and I love that all of y'all are so supportive. Thank you. It's, it's, I think it's, we'll build that social, as you said, if society has to change, we're already seeing people are so supportive, so, so thank you. Well, I think there's a lot of support for that across the board. And, yeah. and from all, yeah. all, it's, the review petition is presumably so, coming up. So fingers crossed. But. All right, we're all waiting to see what happens in that. Yeah. Fine, so those are some of his suggestions. Ma'am. I think it comes back to leadership and authenticity. And true leadership and real leadership, global leadership, requires that it, you have a diverse outlook, but that your goal is to unite the inside and the outside of the individual. All right, I would say one, one, yeah. one idea. Two, two ideas. One is, you know, start young, as what, you know, Ms. Rani said. Start young with the kids. Show, you know, by your own actions at home. You know, if you, you know, use and you start showing diversity at home, then your kids will pick it up and then, you know, and then it starts growing. Second bit is, you know, in terms of the corporate world, start thinking about agile workplace, you know, because okay. that's going to really help us change our mindset. Okay, I'm going to give you the um, final words. I think what Ms. Singh and Mukundanji both have said about picking up uh, women from universities so that you can develop them in the corporate world, my plea to them and everybody here uh, in this forum is this, that as a minister, I had uh, given women the facility that, as Mr. Bajaj had said, that women give up their education either due to marriage or childbirth. For the first time for PhDs, through which women actually go up the corporate world or in the world of technology. I said that we give maternity leave for women who want to have children while uh, pursuing PhD so that that break allows them to come back to their education and complete it. Similarly, if you are dislocated due to marriage, then your PhD travels with you from one university to the other, which is the first in Indian history. Mm -hmm. So my request is if you go out and converge your efforts with universities, that is the one uh, law that you'd want to be totally, uh, you know, adhered right. to because that gives women movement not only through education to a better job, but it also gives them a movement to a better life. So that's my plea. I end with a plea. I think that's a, that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you all so much for joining us. <laughs> Diversity is something really important and let's continue to push for a more inclusive India.
Thank you. Thank you so much. No, I love the Banarsi and thank you for the shoes also.